a company like Northrop Grumman, or they're working at some place in DOD, they are told to say DOD, not NSA, and they're still in high school. You know, you know, and the thing that the kids love telling me is, Doc, can't tell you what I'm working on. I'd have to kill you. You know, they love saying that. <laughs> to which I, was, I always respond, boy, I was hearing that before you were born. <laughs> <It's not laughs> but, I mean, all the time. And what I like, what really gets kids excited on my campus is, and it is true, we've got large numbers of 19-year-olds who have security clearances. So that means I can tell them we've got all these spies all over campus. And you might see a young woman, and she's a cheerleader, and she's also a spy. Or a, uh, that's really cool stuff, you know? I mean, you talk about getting them excited about STEM when you can be a spy, you know? And these kids are working on problems involving around the world. It is amazing work. And somebody said, well, I'm not sure I'd want to trust a 19-year-old. Well, we send them to the Army, to the Navy when they're 18 years old. You see what I'm saying? We, don't, we haven't thought about the fact children go, to, go off to war, right? So we obviously know that if you expect more from young people, they can give you more. And that's what happened with that Meyerhoff. We said to these kids, you can do this. You can do this. And to faculty who said, well, I'm not sure they've got the background. Well, what would it take? And this is the next point to you about specificity. The question is, when you talk about early college, when you talk about moving to the next level, if it's in the development of mathematics or if it's in the reading or whatever the area, the question is, what's the level of skills right now of the student? And what's going to be required for that student to graduate, to get to the point where they can complete this college course in a reasonable way, college course or a high school course? What we normally do in high school, in K through 12, is we talk about whether somebody passed the test, whether they're proficient or advanced skills or whatever. What we need to do more of, and some of you are doing this, and what we did in a big math science partnership, another one of these programs that we had with NSF, about $12 million, to bring in teachers who had been uh, engineers and med medical people and others who were in their 50s and 60s and wanted to become teachers. I think some of the best teaching you can get, quite frankly, would be people who've been doing other kinds of jobs, who've got so many examples of how STEM is used, and who have raised children. So I could have I could have people of any race going to work in a tough school. When you've raised children, you can do anything. Give me a hand for that. When you have raised children, you can do anything. You know, because what I say is because our own children have gotten on our nerves. So we are, we're used to kids getting on our nerves, all right? You know, my son always says, Dad, you and Mama are always mega nerds. You know, now my son is 35. I say, yeah, but mega nerds can pay their bills all the time. <laughs> Give me a hand for the idea of mega nerds paying their bills all the time. Wait a minute. But it is, it, it is true that when you bring back people who have retired in their 50s and 60s, they know more about life. And they have a way of being able to bring in examples, but also of dealing with the issues. Young people can be difficult. Am I right? You know, my mother used to say, you know, talking about the eighth grade, she would say, you know, that the behavior may not be desirable, but it's normal. And that if you understand that, that the hormones are raging, you, you get that sense of that. But the key for me is how do you? This is the question. How do you help that teacher understand where the student is and where the student needs to be? Now, let me give you an indictment of what we do in STEM usually. Usually in STEM, we'll have two or three exams and quizzes. And you take the results of those exams and quizzes, and you average them together, and that's the grade. I would argue what we've worked to do on our campus is to move much more so to competency-based approach. That is what? The only thing that really matters is, at the end of the course, what is it the student needs to know, and how do you demonstrate that the student knows it? Give me an idea. Give me a hand for that idea of at the end of the course. Now, you notice that the applause are not too great, because a lot of people are still back there just averaging growers. I think it is as archaic as we can have in our education system. What do I mean by that? How many of you remember when your freshman English paper that you got the first paper back and you were shocked because you had some of the red page, there were all these red marks on there. You thought you could write well and the teacher just really showed you where the coherence wasn't what it should be, the introductory paragraph, subject verb agreement, uh, the clarity of ideas, all kinds of stuff. And you're like, oh my God, I'm gonna flunk this course. But then you looked at it and you saw that the teacher had really been working to correct and to give you ideas about how you could improve. Then you rewrote the paper based on the suggestions you gave it back. This time it was better but still had red marks, and it was an iterative process. Are there any English teachers in here? Anybody in the English yet? You get what I'm saying. You keep, you know, in, in the writing itself, good writing is about clear thinking. Once you've got the grammatical skills, I, I saw my mother working on these papers all the time, and she was trying to help children to learn to think and express themselves clearly. And so the more you rewrite 
whatever it is, all of us, the clearer a piece can become. Well, at the end of the course, if you find that the student can write well, that student can get an A, even though the first paper looked really bad. Now think about it. What mattered was what happened at the end. And so in our, in, in our math courses, right now, most students, in some states, 80% of kids who go to community colleges will end up taking remedial math, and 80% of that number don't pass developmental math. And, but it's a traditional approach to the teaching. The question is, how do we change that approach to base it on competency? So as an example, in a math course, how many of you are math and science teachers? Let me see, let me see. In a math or science course, if the student gets a D in the, at the midpoint, what's the probability that the student is gonna get an A or B in the course? Almost nothing, because one, the second half often builds on the first half, am I right? One thing builds on another. And so the question is, if students, if 40% of the students already flunked or got a D on the first half, how do we keep working with them on that first half concept, on those concepts, while we continue to introduce new topics? It takes more time. It does mean professional development. But what we work to do in chemistry, for example, is just that. Use and to give students a chance to see how they compare with others, especially when thinking about how much effort they put into it how much effort they work with other people, how much effort they spend in chemistry tutorial. The other thing is the chemistry tutorial center on our campus is a place you go not because you're struggling, but because you want to do really well. It's a very different idea. How many of you are in schools where it's really cool to be tutored? You, you see what I'm saying? One, you see what I'm saying? Right, right now, most kids feel, oh, I must be dumb if I got to get a tutor. So a part of innovation is changing the notion that only kids who are not smart get help. Because you all know at some point, everybody in here had to get some help. And the question is, how do we change the attitude, the mindset about getting that help? And I'm saying things in a provocative way because I want to have questions and I want you to push back on me on these things. But I'm saying that the traditional way of this giving the first half of the course, they get the D and they keep on trying, but they're bored and you know they're going to flunk it, doesn't make it. We're not going to get there. And if somebody can't get past developmental math, they're not going anywhere. They're not going to be able to go. And so at the heart of the matter is how do we change that teaching and learning? How do we help that student develop the resilience, the toughness to make it? Let me take that Myhoff effort. That Myhoff program has now led to our being the leading producer among predominantly white schools in producing blacks who get MD, PhDs. Give us a big hand for that, MD, PhDs. In fact, I've got several couple of kids right now, African American on the faculty at Duke right now, with in PhDs in neuroengineering, MD, you know, coming out of that. Now that's on the one hand. Let me give you the other side though. We have, look on our website in the Shriver Center for the Choice Program. The Choice Program is for first time offenders. Now I want you to hear me saying this. We started the Meyerhoff in 89, we started Choice in 89. Everybody said, oh, you're being elitist with this Meyerhoff program. The advantage of that program was we were getting high achievers, but now, the average kid who was not as serious in high school wants to be like that kid. You want a climate in which people want to be like the kids doing the best in school. Is there anybody in here who can say that you got more coverage of kids getting A's in physics or English than you do of your basketball team? What is my point? Who is it that our youth see as the most important in our communities? It would tend to be our athletes. Now, I love athletics. Our soccer team is in the top ten right now. I'm very proud of them but I'm more proud of the fact that they're doing well academically. And the question is, do you as educators make the point that the athletics may be great, but it's much, much, much more impressive to see a child succeeding in math and reading than it is to see them as the quarterback of the team? Give me a hand for that, please. If you're educators, if you're really educators, we've got to get to the point of saying it, because if we don't say it, who's going to say it? And so when I think about why our kids are not necessarily doing as well, what is it that we value? When you hear the term American Idol, what do you think about? In our country, it's music, it's, it's entertainment. You get my point? We've got to think about how we get kids to want to be smart. Best thing I can tell you is I've got a lot of little high school kids working with some of my, my house and others saying, I want to be like that. I want to do something called calculus. You know, just having kids wanting to do it is amazing. Now, the other side that I want you to hear about is this choice program, which involves First-time offenders, we supervise 500 little boys, maybe 10% girls, who are first-time offenders. And we've been doing it since 1989. These children are between 8 and 15. 
And the goal is, number one, to keep them alive. Number two, to keep them out of an institution. Number three, to strengthen their skills. Number four, get them ready for college. Get them, have them on a college campus and working with college students regularly and building their skills. And the most important thing I can tell you is that the lessons we learned from Meyerhoff have also worked for children who are coming from difficult situations, very bottom part of America in terms of not having the support that they need. And why are they, why are they with us? Because quite frankly, either the mother is working at night or they're living in a foster care situation. They don't have anybody to really work to give them that support. So we become in many ways like surrogate parents. Now, when we started this program in 89, some of my colleagues said, you mean you're going to bring those criminals to campus? I said, they're children. They're children. If you give a child structure and show that child that you love him, all things are possible. Do you know since 1989, we've never had a major incident? Give us a hand for that. It's a big deal that they've done that. And here is the point. Building community among those students, having them learning to trust each other in groups, having the older kids helping us with the younger kids, grooming little boys who are 12 so that when they're 14 or 15, they can help bring some of the other young kids into this process. And most important, giving them a chance to feel good about being able to solve a math problem or to talk about the reading that they're doing, or to talk about life, and to put their lives in perspective. And then setting the expectation. I began by talking about dreams. And you know, what I found amazing is, when you ask kids the question, what do you want to be? Well, uh, they're going to either tell you they want the NFL, or they want to be MBA, four feet tall, MBA. Or they want to be what they call an entrepreneurial rapper. I said, well, what's an entrepreneurial rapper? You know what that is, right? That means one who makes a lot of money. The kid told me, he said, a lot of people are rappers, but I want to be one who's really into finance, all right? And what is amazing, though, is so when you say, okay, just suppose you don't make it doing that, what else do you want to do? In so many cases, there's no clue beyond that which is surreal. You know, so helping children to learn to dream about the possibilities and to see the relationship between whatever they're doing in school and what's possible. I can never tell you enough about how when we've had high school kids who are working on our campus but who are also getting certifications, computer certifications, and how amazing it is when some of these little first-time offenders see that a 15-year-old has gotten certified in a couple of areas and the kid shows them what he does and the little 8-year-old says, I can do that. And he begins to see the possibilities of moving up that ladder. It makes all the difference in the world. But helping students understand how they can get help from other people, getting them to open up to say, I need the help, having them to believe there are other people around them who care enough. You know, when these children come on our campus, first couple of months, they can look really mean. They would scare anybody in this room. They can look so hard at 12, you know. And yet, within a couple of months, you realize they're children. All of a sudden, they're smiling and saying, hey, Doc. And, and I mean, the most interesting experience for me is the older ones like introducing me to the younger ones, and they'll say, he's the president of UMBC. And the, the young kid would say, he ain't no president of this white school. They're looking at my face, right? And, I, and they say, no, he's the president. And, and the kid will say, prove it, right? I will take out a card that has my name, and, and the next thing they say is, that ain't you, with that name Rabowski, right? I have to get out my card and my driver's license to prove who I am on my own campus, all right? And then they still give you that look like, yeah, right. <laughs> but then I say this, you know, you could do this job one day. And the look on their faces is, is one that I will never forget because children who have not had the experience of being around super successful people have never imagined the possibilities of what they can do. I think the notion of our bringing kids in, college students in, if there's one thing I would want you to do, it is to use college students of all races to help students as they're moving into early college experiences, as they're thinking about graduating from high school, to see the possibilities and to understand the stories of other people. Stories inspire. If I were to come to every one of you and I were to say, tell me your story. In some cases, you've told it before. In other cases, you haven't. But I guarantee you, there's nobody in here. If I said, tell me your story and tell me who made a difference in your life, by the time you finish telling me that story, even you would be inspired because that's what education does. In every one of your lives, somebody said to you, you can do this and made you, whether it was a daddy, your mother, a teacher, a coach, 
It could be any of those people who said, you can do this. And, and, and as a result, you kept going on and on and on. So the specificity for me means building community, having strong relationships, understanding what the rigor should be, understanding how you go from one level to the next, building relationships among teachers at different levels. We are working now with Montgomery College, Anne Arundel College, Howard Community College, Baltimore County, and a Gates grant that looks at the pathway in STEM from high school to community college to four-year institution. And here's the point, that rarely have teachers at different levels had a chance to sit in a non-threatening situation and compare levels of rigor of the work at each level, meaning how one tests, what one covers in the material, the extent to which it's covered, the kinds of examples used, and as a result, when students move from one level to the next, often there is this misalignment. How else do you explain that they can finish all the math and reading courses in high school and still start with remedial math? It is that it's not that the teachers in the high school aren't doing what they should be doing. It's just that we need opportunities to see how we connect the work in such a way that we can be assured that when they finish one thing, they're ready for the next. But that means ongoing, regular meetings in which people know you're not pointing fingers, but you're trusting. Because right now in America, universities blame high schools, who blame middle schools, who blame elementary, who blame the parents, who blame society. So the idea is how do you get away from the finger pointing and move to that village idea saying we've got to find ways of connecting to make it work. And then here is the final piece before I close. It is this. Analytics at every level, whether it's four-year, two-year, or high school or middle school, we have to get away from using simply anecdotal information. Whether you know it or not, most institutions make decisions based on the general thinking, based on the anecdotal information. Everybody here can tell me about some of the best examples. But if I were to say, have you analyzed why students in the sixth grade or seventh grade were unable to do the work in math to go to the seventh grade to the next level? And what were the concepts that they did not understand? And which teaching method was most appropriate? And were boys and girls learning in the same ways? And how will the level of proficiency compare with the, the concepts and the, and the level of rigor in that work? We had a big math science partnership. And what we, lent, what we found most helpful was giving teachers the time to look at the performance of students with granularity. So if students are not doing well at a certain level, whether it's getting ready for remedial work in, in college or for regular work in college, if, if we can have the time to analyze the test, not just the test results, but the performance in order to see where students, where the breakdown is, it is amazing how we can then plan an appropriate approach to helping with the work. We've got these innovation grants we give, and I want to throw that out to you as a suggestion in teaching and learning. We have what we call these academic innovation grants, and one or more teachers can get together and look at courses where students are not doing well and can propose to change the course, to have time for, for professional development, but to change the course in some kooky or creative way that might lead to many more students, particularly underrepresented groups, doing well. So one of the most interesting one right now is called the Math Gym, Gymnasium. And it is a math gym that is there for teachers in certain courses in math and science. And, the, and what we've done is the professor can see where students didn't do well on the test and can say these five students need to come to the math gym. And then there are trainers in the gym who will evaluate the strength of the muscle in certain areas. And based on what they see, whether it's about speed with which they do the work, not understanding certain concepts, they will prescribe certain exercises they've got to do. And you'll see kids on the floor and people tutoring and working together. And the idea is with specificity to figure out why they didn't do well on the test, to let them strengthen those skills, go back to the professor. Then the professor will look at that same test, give them another opportunity to show that they've learned that. And the result is the student does better on the test, rather than simply saying the student got a D and we're moving on. So the idea is how can you, in your settings, use creative approaches to give students more opportunities not only to grasp the concepts, but to understand what it means. And final point, as I close this, I really want to have time for a lot of questions, is this. The stories about understanding students will always be important. One of my students had been to Russia. And he was 
an amazing young guy from the inner city, and he had come to see me, and he had become fluent in Russian. Now, how many Americans who are not of Russian descent are fluent in Russian? This is a big black guy. And I said, son, what do your parents do? And he looked at me, and all of a sudden, he got tears in his eyes. He said, Doc, I never wanted to tell you this. So what's the problem? He said, I am a ward of the state. And I said, oh, boy. I said, tell me your story. He said, when I was 12, my father had become hooked on drugs, and he left us. By the time I was 13, my mother was hooked, and she left me to fend for myself in a crack house. He said, Doc, I've been to hell and back. I didn't think I'd be alive. How did you get to this place, Tavon? He said, I remember that one of my teachers told me, when it's really tough, when it's really tough, all you can do is your best and pray. And he said, every day I would just say, God help me. He said, a social worker got me out of that crack house. I went from foster care to foster care. Finally got into a group home on Liberty Road. He said, and I just kept thinking about the idea that if I just kept asking for help, just God help me to be strong. And if I studied, because one of my teachers told me I was smart, and that made the difference. One of my teachers said, you are smart, and you can do anything with your brain. Because he said, when my daddy left, it was hard. But when your mama leaves you, you feel like you're nothing. He said, Doc, I just didn't think like I deserved to live. I didn't understand drug addiction. I didn't understand my situation. But I just kept making it. And I kept thinking, when that teacher told me, said from being told about prayer and being told to work hard, I did that, he said, and finally, I was able to do well enough, I could get into UMBC, and he did well, he had in the 1200s, math and verb, it was amazing. He said, and what made the difference was, all I would do was read, read the Bible, read books, and the reading helped me out. He said, I'm not a good math student, but I just love the reading, and I, I wanted to learn another language because I wanted to forget about my circumstances. I wanted to go to another country and forget how painful my experience had been in my neighborhood. And amazingly, um, I said, who's coming to your graduation? He said, I have nobody. I said, what about the grandmother you mentioned? He said, she's hooked too. I said, so you don't see any of your family? He says, this is what's strange, Doc. He said, sometimes I'll make sure I get to see them, but I never let them see me because I'm scared. They'll pull me into that culture. I cannot be around them. And amazingly, at his graduation, it was as if my deceased mother was talking to me. Something just said, boy, get up and say something about Tavon because he was there by himself. And I got up and I said, you know, all of us here today are here because of what family has done to make us who we are. But one of our own is here graduating with a 3-5 in language and linguistics. And I want you to let him know we care. When I called his name, people were so shocked that before I knew it, a standing ovation from 10,000 people, not a dry eye, knew it. he cried like a baby. He came up on stage and he said, I just haven't known love. He said, but I will always remember this day that somebody knew I was in the world. That boy went on to have a Fulbright back to Russia. He went to Princeton, got grad degree in international relations. He now works for the State Department, helping people all over the world. If Tavon can do all that, Imagine what we can do if we just remember you never know somebody else's story when they are so difficult or not as tough or not as resilient to know that if we can just say to them, but you can do this. If all the specific strategies I can give you, it is believing in that child that can make all the difference in the world. I challenge you to watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are, not only when people can see you, but what will you do when your mother's not there? There's your character. So thoughts become words, words become actions. Actions become habits, habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values to all of you, we are all so special, and we can be even better. Thank you all very much, thank you. We, think we have time for questions.
So somebody give me some water. I can, I can take some questions. Please challenge me. And, and let me say, I'm not usually so harsh in the way I say that. I purposely said some things uh, more dramatically than I might, just to, just to provoke conversation. I think a part of innovation is just looking at how you can really put up in the air whatever we do and say, is this really the best way to do it? The, the, the final approach to any of the things we're talking about will be some blending of the old and the new. It's never a matter of just getting rid of lecture, for example. Of course, there are times when we lecture. It's the idea, though, how do we not make something so important that we don't question the effectiveness? Questions, please. Somebody. I see a hand there. Aaron. Any other hands? Uh-huh. Is somebody taking on a mic? Uh, Calvin Moore from Bertie oh. County. Okay. Uh, Where was, are you? I'm fine. Right, back. right over here, <laughs> to your right. I can't see. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. I was uh, almost lost my question because I was so much uh, humbled by your the Tavon. So, um, yeah. but my question, um, based on some of your travels as far as time in D.C., do you see all of these initiatives as a national security issue? It's a great question. I, it is. It is very much all of what we're talking about doing, closing the achievement gap, increasing the number of people who succeed. It's absolutely at the core of our national security. The most recent international test of adult literacy skills, looking at people from ages 16 to 65, showed that people over 50 something in America are the best educated in the world. But as you go down the line, the people are less well educated. And the number one issue is that those in that bottom 40% are not getting the skills they need. And here is the most frightening piece of all. It's becoming increasingly difficult for a poor American child to get out of poverty. You see, if you go back several generations, most people in here, regardless of race, will talk about a time when your family was poor, because most families were poor. You go back to the 30s, you go back to the Depression, before Social Security Act, anybody, regardless of race, who was not rich was poor when they stopped working because they got no retirement check. You see, and so we all have known, most people, 90-some percent of Americans have known poverty in their family, and yet they got the education and they moved up. It's all racist. But today, what we're saying is one of the reasons we are less competitive internationally is that the poor group in America, those people are not moving out of poverty as quickly as they are in other countries and therefore are not getting the education they need. So it is at the heart of national security. It's an excellent point. It really is. Other questions? Good morning. I'm Tammy Briggs from Wallace Community College in Selma, Alabama. Yeah, hush your uh, mouth. My dad is from yeah, there. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> That's that Southern talk, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Um, our college is um, in an area which, you know, the Black Belt region, one of the poorest mm -hmm. counties mm -hmm. in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, in terms of what one bit of advice would you give to a leader yes. uh, who is attempting to change a culture and is attempting to get those who may not be a part of that uh, mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. to connect with the with this the population mm -hmm. that we serve mm -hmm. and have a sensitivity mm -hmm. to the struggles yes. and, the, and and be motivated enough yes. to yes. do what it takes to impact change. Yeah, it's an excellent question. You know, last night in Montgomery County, which is a very wealthy county, um, I was working with these children who are from low-income backgrounds but who are doing well. But there were all these people from the county, white, who were, and some upper middle class blacks too, who were there not because these kids were their children, but, but because they said, our future as advantaged Americans is inextricably tied to the future of these children over here. It's when people are enlightened enough to understand that our future really is connected there. I mean, that either we're going to be taking care of them in prison or they're going to be helping to take care of us with Social Security. It's one way or the other that, that we get the kind of connecting you're talking about. In terms of specific advice, I would say two things. Uh, to the extent that you can get educated people and others to help in the mentoring process with children. You know, we, one of the things about Americans is we really do love children. Uh, when I was in that Children's March, it was so clear that Americans all over the country were 
appalled that they had dogs bite us and fire hoses knock us down and put us in jail because we wanted a better education. Americans from all over the country said, this is, this is not America. This is not what we want in America. So when people see and look at the challenges children are having up close, TV helped back in the 60s. Now, you know, if they can have a child who's a mentor, they can be men as a mentee. It's amazing what that can do. That's number one. Number two, I would say the biggest issue I see in poor communities, and especially in the South, as a Southerner, I can say this. We are so good at telling stories, we don't read as much. We read the Bible, which is good, but we don't read as much, and you see it in the test scores. We've got to have more reading, and so even reading stories and talking about those stories and writing about those stories will help because the more a child reads, the better she becomes, right? And once she gets into it, you can never stop it. The problem is most poor kids never get into the habit of reading. So it's the reading and thinking that I, and I'm talking as a math teacher. Give me that child who can read well, I can teach you to do word problems, okay? Dr. Rabowski, I have one last question for you. We have student ambassadors here in this corner and I'm students over there. If you guys can oh, you got some come students this here. way. We oh. do because oh, it's very important to have student voice in this conference oh, as wonderful. we're talking about designing early colleges. So if our student ambassadors could stand, and I wonder what advice you would give them Great. Um, as like they that. think about their futures and That's their excellent. careers. So where I, raise your hands if you're a student ambassador. I see those and those and where, well, oh, very good, very good. Okay, I've got, I've got two things for you. First of all, how many of you like math? All right, I've got a math problem that I'm going to give you, that, and you can discuss it with your adults because I know they can get it. Right? This is a sixth grade problem, but I like it because you can't do it easily. It's the kind you'd see on the international test. It says, I use it all over the country, 29 children are in a class, 20 have dogs, 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? 29 kids are in a class. 20 have dogs, 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? So I want you to think about that problem and discuss it with the adults, and I want you adults to talk about it too. It's a great problem because it's not readily answerable. When you first get the first answer, it probably is not correct. The only time in the last few years somebody got it correct immediately was at a Gates conference of math teachers and somebody Googled the problem. So don't Google it. <laughs> Do not Google it. So even when you've got a PhD, it does take really thinking about it. Most people, it does take, so that's one. The other point, I'm gonna give you a quote from Robert Browning. It says, oh that a man's, ah that a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? I'll say it again. All that a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's the heaven for? I want you to talk about that. And, and I want you to be able to interpret it with each other and with some of the adults here and then tell them. And then the other question, though, the critical thinking is, why would I give you that quote? Why would I? I mean, once you understand what it means, why would I give you that quote? Those are your, those are your assignments. You got them? if you choose to accept them. Now, all students stand up for a minute. I'm gonna give you a poem. You're gonna say this poem after me. All right, stand up everybody, okay? And at the end of the poem, I want you to put your hands, put your hands together like this, put them together. This is what I do with my students. Put your hands together like this and say, focus, focus, focus. You got it? Say it with me. Focus, focus, focus. Okay, as I say a line of this, this is a Langston Hughes poem. I want you to repeat after me. Hold fast to dreams. For if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot, fly. that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams. Fast to dreams. For when dreams go, dreams. life is a barren field frozen with snow. Focus, focus. Okay, now audience, everybody get up. We're going to all say it. Get up, get up, get up. <laughs> That's something about poetry that elevates. Get up, get up, breathe deeply. And now I want you students and others, I want you to say it like you really mean it, like you're at a basketball game. All right, now hold fast to dreams. Uh-uh. No, when we get to education, when you get to math, I want you to be excited. I want you to be going, oh, wow, we're going to do a math problem. A poetry, oh, boy, this is going to elevate our spirits, all right? And, and when you say this poem, students, I want you to dream about your future. For me, it was always, how can I become this math teacher to inspire kids to love math, okay? So here we go. Repeat after me, and I want everybody to project like it's a basketball game. You got it? Hold fast to dreams. For if dreams die, if dreams die life, is a broken -winged bird life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. That cannot fly. 
Hold fast to dreams. For when dreams go, when dreams go life, is a life is a barren field, frozen with snow. Frozen with snow. Hands together, everybody. Focus, focus, focus. You go, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hrabrowski. I know I, uh, I probably am not the only one who always feels just uh, reinvigorated uh, and that you fuel my passion uh, for doing this work. So thank you so much. Um, we are running a little behind schedule, although uh, depending on, on when you get to your rooms, we'll be right on schedule. Joyce, do you want to try to make an adjustment? Or? Yeah, I'll make an adjustment. Hmm. We're going to keep the same length of time, so we're going to ask you to get to your rooms uh, efficiently. We have 10 innovative school visits that I mentioned earlier that have been arranged for you that represent a really interesting range and variety of iterative early college high school designs. You will be able to see 